Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in on Facebook today. This is Kim Russo. I'm the director of AGLCA and I'm thrilled to be here today with Steve and Debbie Russell. They are aboard Gypsy's Palace and they are some of our gold loopers who today are going to share some of the tales of their great loop adventures and beyond um, because they are full-time live aboards and continue to cruise extensively even though they finished their great loop. Just one of the things that's a little bit unusual, um, but becoming more typical actually, is that Steve and Debbie did the loop aboard a catamaran, a power cat, and have continued cruising. They now have a different power cat than the one that they looped on, but um, it is still a power cat, and we get lots and lots of questions from folks who are interested in doing the loop on a catamaran. There are a few considerations, uh, but also I think a lot of myths out there about looping on a catamaran, and Steve and Debbie are always great advocates for a catamaran is a, is a great boat for the Great Loop. So we're definitely going to cover that today. So Stephen and Debbie, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Kim. We're coming to you from Beaufort, North Carolina today. Excellent. And I know you're working your way up the East Coast. So um, buddy boating with some other boats. So are you seeing lots of looper flags out there as you cruise? Still seeing them. Every, you, would, you would think they'd be beyond us, but we're still seeing them. Yep. But every marina we go into and Anchorage we go to, we usually see a flag. Excellent. That makes it a lot of fun. So, where are you headed this cruising season? Are you going around again, or are you planning to stop somewhere uh, for the to wait out hurricane season, basically? Well, we got a late start coming out of Florida. We finally did the St. John's River, which was a goal of ours a couple years ago. And uh, one of the trips we've never made is out to the Outer Banks in North Carolina. So we want to make sure we encompass that. We're really going to stop in Baltimore this year because we've got a lot of things on our cruising plans. We did a lot last year going up the inland rivers. So we thought Baltimore would be fine. We love it there. One of the great things about the loop is that once you finish it, it's never the end because you've gone past places that you want to go back and visit. Like last summer, we were up on the rivers, the Chattanooga, or, or we went up to Chattanooga, uh, up the Cumberland River and up the Tennessee Rivers and spent all summer up there because when we did the loop, we didn't get a chance to see that. And now we're going out to the Outer Banks, which is part of the loop, but we didn't get a chance to see it when we did it. So when you're done with the loop, you're not done yet. And I think more and more people are finding that out, particularly um, we see more and more who planned kind of the somewhat traditional seasonal year long great loop and then found out that that wasn't really enough time for them to do all the side trips they wanted and see all the different things. So Steve and Debbie are a great example of uh, a, a couple who decided to continue um, and go around and you haven't completed the platinum loop, correct? No, we haven't. We're just because you've done thousands of miles elsewhere. <laughs> but we have our flags for the down east loop, so that's <laughs> yeah. As soon yeah. as Canada opens up, that that'll be our goal. So we do. We're gold in the loop, and then we'll be gold in the down east loop, and then after that's probably when we'll look at doing the actual loop again. Well, and you've done most of it a second time. You've just kind of meandered about in different directions. So, um, you know, if the platinum isn't in your future to actually do certain portions of it to each their own. But um, so Gypsy's Palace, tell us where the boat name comes from, because there's always a great story behind that. Well, we do have a great story because uh, we are card carrying Parrothead members. And Jimmy Buffett has a song called Gypsy's in the Palace. And the great story behind that is he wrote that song with Glenn Fry of the Eagles. They were out in Aspen and Jimmy was going out on tour. And he asked Glenn, hey, is there anybody you know that can watch my house while, we're, while I'm out on tour? And Glenn says, well, I've got the guys for you. So Jimmy hired them. And of course, they proceeded to party like there's no tomorrow <laughs> in his house. And the whole time he was gone, they had people in the pool and ate all his food, drank all his booze. <laughs> so um, we just love, we, we're we members of the Fort Lauderdale Club and somebody from the club came up with that name. So we love Gypsy's Palace because also our boat is like a palace and we're water gypsies. Very fitting. So was Lulu's one of your favorite stops then on the loop? We did go there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the one in Alabama, not the one in Myrtle Beach. Right. Yeah, and, and for those of you who have not been there, Lulu's is actually owned by Jimmy Buffett's sister. There's uh, one in um, 
Well, as you said, in Alabama, I didn't even realize there was one in Myrtle Beach. So that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. Yep. The one in Alabama is the original, I, I believe. It yes. is. So let's talk a little bit. Um, tell us about, and we'll probably come back to this because the nature of Facebook, we usually have people coming in and out, and we always start to get questions near the end about the boat because from people who missed the beginning. But for those who are here now, um, and I do want to mention to those of you who are watching now, you're welcome to type questions for Steve and Debbie into the chat, in into the comments in Facebook. We can see them here, pop them up on the screen, and we can answer those for you. So we'd love to make this interactive. Feel free to ask your questions or send your comments or your shout outs along, and we'll uh, we'll show those to Debbie and Steve. Um, but so tell us about your looping Gypsy's Palace, because it's not the same one you currently live aboard. Um, but tell us about the, I'm not sure yeah. if that was the first Gypsy's Palace or not, but the looping Gypsy's Palace, tell us about her. It was the first Gypsy's Palace, and uh, it was, very interesting boat is a 47 foot leopard power cat that's 25 feet wide. Uh, it was three bedroom, uh, three bath. Uh, and uh, we didn't know exactly how it was going to work originally because the 25 foot wide is a pretty wide beam. But we found right after we moved on the boat that it was never an issue. Uh, wherever we went, we had plenty of room. Uh, every marina that was available to us, we never got stuck in saying, oh my goodness, we can't find a marina. Uh, we were always taken care of uh, for the whole loop. Uh, great boat to anchor in. Uh, the exterior was great. Matter of fact, on the whole loop, usually whatever marina we were in, we did the dock tails on the back of our boat because we could put about 20 people back there. And then in Chicago, uh, we were doing dock tails on the back of the boat and sun was setting. I said, well, let's go ahead and everybody, no one had been on a catamaran before. I said, well, let's take it on out. And we had about 25 people on board. So I had them all run back to their boats and get life jackets. So we were all covered in case we got stopped. And uh, and we took them out for a sunset cruise and we came back in uh, long after dark. Uh, so it was, a, it was a great boat to have, shallow draft at three and a half feet, plenty of power uh, and, and lots of room. So what? Uh and I'm glad you addressed the marine issue because that's usually the first question I get is, uh, and it's really twofold. You know, the first one is, will I have a hard time finding a marina that can fit me and that has the space for me? And then the second one typically is, are they going to charge me more because of the wide beam? So what's your, been ex your experience been with that at the marinas you've traveled to, which is, you know, all over um, the loop at this point? Well, you figured we have lived on board a cat now five years and uh that cat we lived on for over two two and a half somewhere around there um only once did we ever get charged more than a standard slip rate because we usually were out on t-heads and they usually don't charge any they used to charge a long time ago for t-heads because it's considered the luxury spot but now because of the size of boats have changed uh they're not charging more for a t-head Personally, we call it life on the tea head, and I love it because our view in the morning is looking out over the water and not at somebody's boat next to us, but we never got charged for that. The one time we did, uh, that place has now changed the rules after I had a discussion with them, and now they just, any big boat gets charged more because they take up more space. Gotcha. Um, so we do have a, oh, go ahead, Debbie. Um, as far as reservations went, I probably only during the loop, I only called less than a week, you know, just a few days out to get a reservation. So we were pretty much always able to get something in a marina. And if not that marina, the next one that was next door to it. So it didn't present a problem much at all. What we're seeing now, though, and we've made a notation of it, is that people are buying bigger looping boats. I mean, they're buying 50 feet plus in looping boats. And when we looped in 2017, that really wasn't the case. Another thing yeah, and that's a little bit oh. of a drawback for us because of our 25 foot, we couldn't do the Trent Severn waterway because we're right. too wide. So, yes. but, but we took a different route and came down through Lake Erie and uh, actually enjoyed it because we stopped at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We stopped off and watched the start of the uh, Mackinac uh, Port Huron sailboat races. So we still had a great time. We just didn't get a chance to do the Trent Seven. Yeah. 
Well, and there's there's lots of loopers out there this year, uh, kind of following in your footsteps, not doing the Trent Severn until the U.S.-Canadian border is reopened. And, um, you know, really, depending on which way they're going through that area, there's really a lot of people raving about the Erie Canal. And I, it, I like hearing that because the Erie Canal can, can be such a gem, um, like the Trent Severn is, if we can kind of get it... Um, to become a destination. Uh, and there's lots to see on Lake Erie too, as you mentioned, Cleveland. I visited Cleveland not too long ago and was amazed at, it was, it's a great city. I think it really gets a bad rap, um, but especially by boat that, you know, there's Marina right there in the heart of, of the downtown area and you can go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So it's a, it's a neat trip. So do you feel like you missed anything by not getting to do the Trent Severn? Well, it was kind of odd. We had a little mechanical problem, so we were broken down in Port Dalhousie, Canada, and our buddy boat, One Eye Dog, was sitting there in Trentport, and they asked us if we wanted to come over and do the first six locks with them. Not that six locks was a whole lot on the Trent Severn, because there's a, like a million, but uh, <laughs> we got a little bit of a flavor that way. And then, you know, we met everybody in North Channel and Georgian Bay anyway. We were right there in the Bustard Islands. And I was hoping Canada might open for the loopers that are kind of coming through because we didn't really go up that area until almost August, early August. Yeah, same with me. I was really hoping that, you know, even if people, it was getting too late to do the Trent Severn, if people could go through Lake Erie and Lake Huron and then kind of head up, you know, coming the other direction into the North Channel and then Georgian Bay, at least to experience that. But um, we shall there's, see, I suppose. There's really only two spots on the Trent Severn that I would say we missed. And that was the, uh, the two locks, uh, the lift lock and the train, what I call the train lock. Right. Uh, those were the two things. Kind of the way I look at it is if we wanted to go back and do it, we could always drive over and talk to some loopers, and I'm sure they would love to take us through those locks so we could actually experience them. Our current, uh, our current boat. And, yeah, and it's, it's a great thought. I didn't realize that you had gone in and done some of it with One Eye Dog, which is a great idea just, as you said, to get the flavor of it. You can you go you know, a little bit of the ways and then turn around and go back when you get to the stopping point for your boat or the stopping point for when you're ready to, to, you know, not have to backtrack quite so much. So that's a, a great way to go about that because it's not the full Trent Severin that a 25 foot beam can't do. It's, I, I think there's only one lock that a 25 foot beam can't do. I could be wrong about that. There may be more than one, but many of them are perfectly accessible to a catamaran. So I love that you got a taste of it. Uh, we do have some comments coming in. A little bit, uh, mm -hmm. I can imagine. So um, Paul says that Paul says that he's also uh, not going to raise and he's going to take his time um, thinking about heading north. His question is, is there any way to give a heads up going north over two seasons? Um, I'm not sure if I'm totally understanding that question. Yeah, I don't either. But I will say that uh, uh, and I remember uh, in an interview you did, Kim, you're talking about some people do it in, you know, six months. Some people do it in six years. Uh, it all depends. A, a lot of people just move from an area, then store their boat for the off season, uh, which might be the winter, uh, and then continue to come back and continue on. They're working. Uh, and that works for, we meet a huge amount of people that do that. So that's a very easy thing to do. We did it in nine months. That's because with no house, no cars, living on board, we really didn't want to spend the winter time on the boat up north. And so we did push through and get done in nine months, which was another reason for us going back and doing some of the stuff we didn't do when we did it the first time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, you know, to Paul's question uh, and really what you just said, Steve, you can head back you know, if you're living aboard and don't want to store the boat to spend a second summer season on the northern parts of the route, you can head far enough south that, you know, you're not, it's, you're not going to have to winterize the boat. Um, and then you kind of have a, have a head start on going north again because you're not leaving from all the way down in Florida. And you can spend an extended cruising season on the Great Lakes for that second season. So, and I do see more and more people talking about doing that as well. Also got a, a hello from Susan and Greg on Lucky Me. 
Um, hi, Susan and Greg. Last I heard, they were on the Erie Canal as well because they're working on their platinum loop. So it's great to see Lucky Me out there. Um, and Lynn is starting her loop in August from Saginaw Bay. So um, oh, good to see you, Lynn. Home. That's so so close to my hometown, Lynn. I'm from Port Huron. So um, neighbors. What I what I want to tell loopers and planners is that Michigan is a hidden gem. All the little towns in Michigan, we just loved it. And of course, I'm from there. But um, when you, especially when you loop down that western side of Lake Michigan, it's only 20 some miles to the next port. And it's so, <laughs> Steve hates it when I say this, but it's so quaint and charming. <laughs> but it you, is. <laughs> why do you hate that? Okay, so every time I read in a book, it says the town is quaint and charming. I'm afraid I look and say, okay, so that means old and run down and trying to regroup. So. Oh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were a couple of those, I will say. Yeah. But you can always guarantee you get into those towns and there'll be an antique store somewhere. But uh, There you go. <laughs> and, the, and the highlight for y'all is that you've been in brown water forever. And the minute you hit the St. Clair River, which is close to my hometown, it is blue 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 and you come through lake huron and it's blue and lake michigan is just like the bahamas i'm sure there's lots of people looking forward to that as they're worrying about the mustache on their boats from coming through the brown water we have here in charleston um and Susie q susan pillett says hello hello there oh yeah we remember her very much we were both we were in coin jock around the time of her big mishap so, yes. Yep. Um, I'm not sure she liked your description there, Steve, of the uh, quaint, <laughs> quaint and charming. <laughs> Good to see you, Susan. Thanks for joining us. So um, you looped with two dogs aboard. That's another topic we get a lot of questions about is looping with pets. And um, I think until you're out there on the loop, a lot of people probably don't realize how many dogs, especially, but pets in general are actually out there. Lots of people are boating with their dogs, looping with their dogs and cats and occasionally other little furry or feathered friends. Um, but tell us, uh, you know, any tips or tricks or thoughts that you have about looping with pets that made it easier for you that maybe somebody just starting out, maybe you can shortcut the learning curve for them on the, the pets. Well, we left um, Boca Raton with two dogs. One was a two and a half year old Schnauzer, or actually he was a little, he was older than that. But um, Steve went out to Home Depot and bought a grass pad we had read on the, uh, if you guys go to the Boat Galley website, she talks a lot about how to train your dog on how to, how to adjust to the boat. So we read that, but then our neighbors gave us a, their dog to take on the loop because we dog sat that dog all the time. And that is a Shih Tzu Poodle. And that dog acclimated perfectly. He went to that mat. He knew exactly what it was for. He pooped, he peed on it. Great. But our dog, Jazzy, there was just no way. Um, but anyway, we took off anyway. And we were known at one point as Gypsy's Pea Palace, uh, <laughs> mainly because everybody was bringing their dogs to our boat to train them. Because one thing we learned was if, if we have our pad up there and other dogs will come because it's our pad, they'll pee on that pad. So people will bring their pads and put it on top of our pad. Our dog pees on their pad. They take it back to their boat and they think, well, there's been a dog here. So they just naturally pee on it. Such a wonderful subject. But it, the <laughs> is, you really got to outlast last your dog. And they say, you know, you're, there's no problem with your dog. You just don't take them to shore. So the great story with Jazzy is that we had both dogs on board. We're in the Bahamas and we're anchored and the weather is crappy. And Steve says, I'm not taking the dinghy down. So that day, nobody got the, on the dinghy, including the dogs. And our uh, Mozzie, the Shih Tzu Poodle, oh, great, using the pad the whole time. Jazzy, not doing it. So, okay, now we've gone 24 hours. We've got a whole new day. Steve goes, I'm still, I'm not taking the dinghy down. No dogs are going in. So we're there waiting and waiting. And Poor Jazzy, I can tell he is getting, he's getting a little worried. His brown eyes are getting browner. <laughs> but <he's> getting <laughs> so now we've gone 48 hours and Jazzy has not gone. So finally, so we're, we're loop, we're, we're there with one eye dog. Now they've all gone into shore, 
They've gone to the restaurants and bars and they've been having fun. What have we been doing? Sitting on the daggum boat. And I finally, after 56 hours, I said, Steve, get the dinghy down. We're going to shore. I mean, Jazzy went immediately. So now we know, heck, he can hold it 56 hours. He's good. Wow. Yeah, yep. they're not going to die. They're not going to die. They're not going to blow up. They they <laughs> will go when they need to go. And Jazzy has gone on the pad out of desperation or mm -hmm. jealousy because some other dog went there. He knows what it's for, but he chooses not to do it. So, okay, if you, that's your choice. So how hard is it, uh, particularly with smaller dogs in the south where you have to worry about gators, how hard is it if you choose to anchor out um, and you want to bring the dog to shore for exercise or to do its business, is it difficult to find a safe place to do that or do you worry about that? I, I usually leave them out there for gator bait, but you know. No, <laughs> no we just did the St. John's River and it was gator mating season. So we're Floridians and I was very cognizant of that. Um, of course, Mozzie, not a problem. He stays on the boat. Now, some of the places would have a little park there. We were good with that. That was good. But we were in a place one time where um, nobody went to shore. So that was another time Jazzy had to had to hold it. But yeah, we we worry about that. We don't we don't let them off their leash, of right. course, and we keep them very close to us. But there are parks, and and a lot of times you're pulling up to a quaint and charming town. And uh, so there's plenty of places there to, to take them off and walk them around. And, and oh, the worst is tensis, which is part of your loop. You're coming down the uh, rivers and you've left Demopolis and you must, I mean, it, you just can't make it to the to Mobile. So you have to anchor out and there is no shore leap there. We found a little clearing that is kind of muddy and we were able to bring the dinghy there and they couldn't go very far. And one dog went and one dog didn't. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> but dogs do, dogs and cats. We see cats, too. Uh, and is, is, is one friend of ours has a parrot who did the loop. And, uh, <laughs> oh, I wonder who that could be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, so it, all, all kind of animals go around. But um, uh, they all do well. We don't see anybody. I mean, it. I will say that I like to see that the dog matches the size of the boat. Uh, and, but I do see sometimes a big lab on a 27 foot sailboat and I think it's a little small, but, uh, but they do really well. And, and I, you know, we kid with our dogs that they're having a ball because they're getting smells they've never smelled before. They're going to places they've never been before. They're definitely not bored. So it's actually pretty excitement for a pet. I think the key is your dog has to be friendly too, because yeah. um, they're they're meeting other dogs and people all the time, and I think it's really important. The dog just has to be friendly. Yeah. Any issues with bringing a pet um, to the Bahamas or to Canada, for that matter, when the border reopens? Canada was never an issue. You never had to do anything. The Bahamas, there is paperwork to do, so I clearly suggest that everybody follows the paperwork. Um, you can find it online, but typically you've got to get your dog to the veterinarian and have a, a form filled out right before you go. Now, they're really in the Bahamas not so concerned that you may meet a two-week window. They know about bad weather and, uh, and that sort of thing. And we've been several times, and I'm going to tell you, they never look at the paperwork, but it's good to have. I, I would clearly recommend that. Just you uh, all you got to do is Google it. Uh, taking your dog to the Bahamas and, and they'll come up with all the paperwork in the process. And there's a guy in Nassau that everybody uses to uh, get some of the paperwork through and that, and it's all done electronically. So it's great. It's pretty easy. Yeah. So uh, Pam from CC Rider says, hi, oh. I guess you enjoyed a rocket launch with them. Yes. So this year we were in Titusville and they were anchored by us too. And it was the rocket launch that went off at like five something in the morning, it went a nighttime launch. It was just incredibly beautiful. And for those future loopers, that is uh, what we do is when we come up the coast of Florida there, we start Googling when the rocket launches are going to be. And we try to time ourselves to be in Titusville. That's really the best place for your rocket launch. And that's, that's, that's something also that when you're looping, um, 
you, people will tend to in this planning stage say, yeah, we're just going from here to here to here to here. But one of the things you want to do is you want to do things like, is there a launch coming up when I'm coming through Titusville? Is there something special? Like one of my favorite places is Paducah. Uh, we were there when they opened up their docks for the first time. And they've got the, I mean, the quilt museum there, you know, I thought quilt museum, okay, this is going to be quite charming. But it was, uh, but it was actually one of the most intriguing places I'd ever been to in my life. But we get there and they're having a barbecue contest going on throughout the whole town. And so check when you're moving along, whether you're doing loop on a schedule or not, check to see what events are going on in all these towns because there's things going on all the time that you get to participate in. Paducah's had a lot of a lot of buzz, so to speak, in the last couple of years, ever since they built the docks, really. And it's a great example for some of the other small towns along the rivers who would like to be bringing in some tourism. Um, Paducah built that transient dock, and um, now they're you know on our best of list for restaurants, and um, the Quilt Museum is one of the top museums. And um, it's really, really neat to see that from a small, quaint town, <laughs> quaint and charming town on go. the river system. Um, Christian just pointed out uh, when we were talking about the blue waters of Lake Michigan that uh, that area is absolutely not to be missed. And yes, uh, you can cruise the Great Lakes. You can cruise Chesapeake Bay for you. There's so many places on the loop you can cruise for years. And that's one of the reasons I think Steve and Debbie are still going around <laughs> and around again. And then Christian also mentioned that the blue's clear water, of course, but it's also fresh water, which is, a, you know, a nice change as well after kind of the salt water of Florida and the brackish water as we're heading up the East Coast. So thanks for chiming in on that, Christian. I was just cleaning off the mustache off the front of our boat the other day again. Oh, and, uh, oh yeah. And the thing that was really not common to us being from Florida was all the spiders and the spider poop. <clears throat> so that was, that's the, the downside of fresh water. But I didn't notice it so much in Michigan, but boy, on the rivers, you definitely can. This is where when you go to the rendezvous for the planners, it's really important because you pick up on really important things like spider poop and, <laughs> um, uh, and, and all these little tidbits that you're not going to read online and, and stuff like that. But you meet up all these other people who have done it. Uh, and have been around it, and now you're learning all these tricks about the whole thing uh, by going to the rendezvous. So it's, it's worth every minute and every penny of it. Yeah, absolutely, and we, we cannot wait to get back to in-person rendezvous. So the fall rendezvous at Joe Wheeler State Park is uh, it is happening. Um, unless something you know drastically changes and we take some steps backwards, but right now it is on the schedule, and um, registration is opening on Monday. Uh, July 19th. Um, so right around the corner, really. Well, one of my, our favorite memories uh, of the rivers was going, it's on the way to Joe Wheeler. So if you're going by boat, you go through Florence. Stop in Florence, Alabama, because it is so full of history. If you're a music fan of, of anything, the Muscle Shoals Studios there and uh, how all this music was recorded the Rolling Stones came there. Aretha Franklin. I, I mean, everybody that was big in the music industry went through Muscle Shoals, and they had yeah. this particular sound. There's a um, there there's a uh, a movie, a documentary about it that we looked at online before we went there, and uh, plus it's got a great fried chicken place. Not that we like fried food, but I need to tell you that was great fried chicken. I'm glad I'm glad she brought that up because one thing I can tell you in the nine months, well, we continue to this day, but when you're on the loop, you, you eat out a lot. I mean, there's there's, there's two things. It, you learn that at the end of the loop, there's Jenny Craig and there's AA, but uh, <laughs> because there's so so much fun and so much food, but. Uh, we spent all that time and never once during that whole time did we eat at a franchise restaurant or a chain restaurant. All these, and I, I kid about them being quaint and charming towns, but all these towns have restaurants owned by locals with their own flavor of food that is so worth stopping in and, and enjoying while you're in the town. So let, 
let's talk about the boat again. Uh, we've had some other people join us since we started with that. So um, Steve and Debbie looped aboard a power catamaran and are still, loop well, they're still cruising, um, may or may not close a second loop, um, but still cruising extensively aboard a different power catamaran. So um, let's go back to the Leopard first and just kind of give her specs, if you will, because we didn't really talk about cruising speed and, and things like that and fuel economy on that particular boat. So let's let's touch on that real quick. Let's hit it. Okay, so uh, it was a Leopard 47 foot by 25 foot wide power catamaran. Uh, you see them a lot in charters down in the, in the Caribbean and the Bahamas. Uh, this was not a charter boat. It was a custom built boat for an owner that we bought it from. Um, a lot of room on the boat itself with a three and a half foot draft. Uh, it's nice and it's nice and shallow water. Uh, like Kim said, our cruising speed, we, and I'm going to talk miles per hour just because it's easier for most people. We cruised at 10 miles an hour and we burn for anybody that understands that part, we burn four gallons an hour. So we were very economical. We could do 20 miles an hour and only burn 17 gallons an hour. So we we're still economical, and I wish I had those engines in this boat that we have now, which is a 50-foot Leopard power cat. Oh, no, Endeavor. Endeavor power. Yeah, we're, we're away from Leopard. Now. I've got cats on my mind. The, uh, uh, and so this boat is a lot heavier, and it, and it chews up a lot more fuel, but we have a lot more interior space. So, again, doing the loop in a 25-foot boat, wide boat is not a problem. Uh, the only thing we couldn't do is the Trent Severn uh, because there's a 22 foot max uh, width at some point during the Trent Severn. Uh, but anywhere else, we had no problem with dockage. We never got charged extra money for dockage. And we always had a lot of people on board to have uh, dock tails with. So it was a great, any power cat's a great, stable, nice riding boat to, to do the loop in. Okay. Well, tell us about your current Gypsy's Palace. So that's a, an endeavor. <laughs> Our current Gypsy's Palace uh, is an Endeavor power catamaran built in Clearwater, Florida. Uh, it is 50 foot long, 18 feet wide. So we can slip into almost anywhere we want to go to. Uh, we're a massive looking boat, and that's because we have 850 square feet of interior space. Uh, we're two stories, totally enclosed, but upstairs, in our helm, we open up all the windows, open up the front door, the back door, and it's like being in an open air uh, helm station. Uh, but it, with 850 square feet, three bedroom, two and a half bath, uh, dining, we call it a dining room. Uh, and uh, right now, actually, uh, our laptop is sitting on top of an island in the kit in the galley. And you can see in the back, you can see the stairs that go up over my head to go upstairs. Uh, so there's a ton of room in it. It is so comfortable, but it's like any other cat. It's a nice, stable ride. Uh, we go over wakes and we never even feel them. Uh, so it, it, cats, I'm sorry, cats are the way to go. <laughs> <We love them. laughs> and if you have not seen um, Stephen Debbie's boat, it is length and beam. It's not that out of the ordinary, but living space, it's very clear. <laughs> that it is massive. Um, I mean, you have more interior space and more living space to live comfortably, probably than any other boat I've seen on the loop, regardless of the size. It's I'm sure you hear that a lot. Yeah, well, when we walk, our whole first level is the galley and, and the den. But when you walk into the master stateroom, you got a king size bed, we totally walk around with closets and everything. Uh, we don't have a house, we don't have a car. This is our home. And so we wanted to be like a home. I had two rules. I don't hit my head and I don't feel like I'm in a closet when I take a shower and this boat accomplishes both of those. So what led to the switch from the Leopard to the Endeavor? Was it just the size? Um, and, and at what point in your loop did you make the change? Um, we were really okay with the Leopard, but we had seen this model boat at the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show since, nine, uh, since 2009, and we always wanted one, but there were so few of them available. So one became available. There's only 10 of them out there. Um, the reason part of it is being that I lived in Florida so long, I needed to be out of the sun. So I, we needed a boat where I wasn't going to get direct sunlight all day long. Um, 
we have a big sky lounge upstairs that's all enclosed with open windows. So I'm out of the sun. I feel like I'm in the open air. Um, and both boats too had great line handling capability. I find that sometimes we come across looper uh, boats that the person doing the lines, it's very difficult because they can't walk all the way around the boat. And we really like that about a catamaran is that you definitely have the ability, the visibility and the ability to walk around. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a beautiful boat. And, and Steve, of course, um, kind of turned that love for catamarans into his business because he is also one of our sponsors um, as a yacht broker specializing in catamarans. Yep. So what made you, uh, and forgive me for not knowing this, but were you a yacht broker prior to the loop or was this something that you decided to take on after your loop because of your passion for looping in a cat? Nope. I actually uh, had been a captain for several decades and, and had a yacht management company and was a yacht broker, uh, but not any specialty. And, and I really didn't push it because... Um, it was just something I had there because it kind of worked in with my yacht management company. Somebody I was managing their boat wanted to sell it, then I could sell it for them, or if they were looking for another one, I could help them find one. And then I let my license lapse after I retired when we moved on board in 2016. And people kept asking about cats and asking about cats and asking about cats. And finally, I'll be honest with you, Deb looked at me and said, you need to renew your license. You know, <laughs> People are going out buying cats and they're not buying them through you. And I had really become proficient on, on catamarans, living on board one and being around them and everything. And so I renewed it. Um, and uh, I immediately, it, it took me two seconds to think, I need to become a sponsor of AGLCA uh, because it, it's, it's a great grounds to work with and a great organization to work with. So I did. And I mean, I, Kim, I don't think it was a month after I became a a sponsor that I sold my first boat through through uh, AGLCA by posting it. Uh, it, it was a, a boat exactly like ours, uh, mm -hmm. 50 foot uh, Endeavor Power Catamaran. I posted it on, on the site and gave a little talk about it at nine o'clock in the morning on a Friday. Uh, by 11, I had a phone call, showed it Saturday, Sunday was Mother's Day, and, and Monday I had a contract on it. Uh, and that was before COVID. <laughs> no, all boats are selling that fast. No, we all had to wear masks. I remember. Oh, really? On that. Oh, Interesting. Right. Actually, that's right. You joined us um, just before COVID in January, I think, of 2020. Um, so yeah, by the time you got to the, it would have been during COVID, but it was before the the frenzied boat buying. I think that we're seeing now, where um, there's just, a lot of boats are selling quickly, which is one of the things. Um, you know, we've got so many members that are kind of on the hunt for that first boat for the loop. Um, they may have a boat that's not loop friendly. Are you seeing, Steve, um, any of your clients struggling with the insurance piece? Because finding a boat is one thing and brokers can certainly help you with that because they tend to have a little bit of a heads up on what might be coming to market. But the other component that's really changed, um, not necessarily directly related to COVID, but around the same time, the insurance market really changed. So are you seeing any struggles for your clients with, with being able to insure the boat they'd like to buy? There's actually two aspects that have changed a lot. Uh, and, and both of it really has to do with the insurance. But one is, uh, and I'll let Deb, Deb talk to you. She's the insurance expert. Uh, but uh, uh, one has to do with the fact that people trying to buy a 50 foot boat who the only thing they've had before was a jet ski or maybe even a 26 foot boat are having a big problem because of the boat size uh, and, and the size and the ability to run that boat and the insurance companies have become big on that. But really she can describe it much better than I can. <laughs> he says that because my whole career was in the insurance industry. However, gotcha. <laughs> I'm not in the marine business, but I, I do understand what's going on and it's, it's really, it's a cycle. Um, the market is hard right now. Carriers are leaving the market. You know, what worries me, we're with Geico also. Um, we were with um, a sponsor of HELCA, but Geico won't renew through him. So we have to go direct or take another market. 
but there's so many people what worries me just this is a personal thing i don't i don't know that what would ever happen but so many people are insured with geico and they're taking this chance uh, opportunity to weed through those people they don't want anymore by saying we don't want to do business with brokers so um it gives the pe that gives them the opportunity to get rid of old boats it gets rid of the people with claims and that sort of thing so um, there's always somebody that's going to fill the gap and a good insurance broker can find a, a market for you. Yeah. Um, I think one thing that um, I think you pointed it out, Kim, first, because we listened to one of your broadcasts with probably Ken Marks, was that you used to be able and Steve can attest to this because he's been in this position about being a, you want to talk yeah. about that. Um, one of the things that the insurance company is looking at when I have my yacht management company, I had to do this. A lot people would buy a new boat insurance companies say you don't have any experience on that boat you have to have a captain and so i would have to either back then i could just certify by taking them out and training them and watching them operate and stuff and i could certify to the insurance company that they were capable of running the boat uh it's gotten much stiffer now to where in many cases they want you to have a hired captain and i'm not talking about somebody that lives on the boat we're talking about every time the boat leaves the dock you have to have a captain on board for a year. And so now they put more of a time frame on it. Uh, that's not every insurance company, but uh, it's the ones that we're seeing the most of that are requiring that kind of a requirement. So I would highly recommend two, two things I highly recommend uh, for people looking to buy a boat for the loop. Don't buy anything too big if you haven't owned boats before. And also when you buy a boat, because the insurance companies look at this, they're looking at the age of the boats. And so don't go buying a 1980s boat and expect to jump right into the market. Uh, but also be sure not to try to go with a boat, get a boat you can afford and a boat you can manage. Because if you buy one that needs some fixing up, uh, then uh, it must be playtime. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know why Mozzie just came screaming out in the hallway and decided he wanted to spin around. Uh, That's fine. We're dog friendly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but buy one that's ready to go, not one that you say, well, yeah, I can fix it up. I can spend six months to fix it up. I can guarantee you from being in the industry for so many years, it's going to cost you a whole lot more money than buying a boat that's in great shape already. Um, but that's with the insurance companies. They're looking at the quality of the boat, too. They're going to look at that survey, and they're going to figure out on that survey, if it's not in really good shape, they're not going to insure it. They're not going to be a risk taker like they used to. Yeah, and I do love what you said, Deb, that it is cyclical, and it will come back. So I don't want too many folks out there to be, you know, very discouraged by the current market. Most of, There's been, you know, AGLCA sponsors who are insurance brokers have been pretty successful in finding most people coverage somewhere. Um, so there are some options out there. And uh, Jim asked a question for you, Steve. You mentioned you had to renew your license, and he's just uh, wanted to check in on whether you were talking about your captain's license or your broker's license when you mentioned good, that. Good question. Uh, I should have clarified that. No, I've never left my captain's license. I've got a 100-ton uh, captain's license, sail locks, uh, towing, and uh, uh, also STCW. Uh, that I've always kept going because I want to keep that going. Um, but the broker's license, I thought I'm not going to be out there selling boats. I, and also, I really only act as a buyer's broker. Uh, I don't act as a listing broker because I can't manage it. And uh, I know I just took on a listing, but because the listing was somebody who I knew was going to be with the boat, I didn't have to manage the listing. And plus, we already had a, a buyer. I will tell you, what we do a lot is that people are looking for power cats. There is, the inventory is so low we find out what they're looking for. We're in touch with a lot of owners. In fact, we're the facilitators of the Power Catamarans group on uh, Facebook and the facilitators of the um, Endeavor owners group. So we usually know when a boat is coming on the market. And one time Steve put to an individual that was selling by owner with somebody that had been looking for a boat that Steve had been trying to help but we just put them together to do a deal. We knew that, you know, they were savvy enough to do it. Yeah, and I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a broker because I'm making a living at it. I, I don't depend on it. So my attitude towards it's a lot different. Uh, 
So as a buyer's broker, I, I don't have to really necessarily manage the, the listing. But I will say the last three boats I've sold, I think the last three never hit the market before I sold them. Uh, because they have like a list of people who are looking for some, and I'll find out through the grapevine that some's available and uh, kind of move on it. So, uh, yeah, it and is, that's, it that's one of the benefits of working with a, a broker. And, you know, a lot of people um, try to go it alone initially when they're looking for a boat. And, you know, I always tell them, besides the fact that you've got somebody looking out for your interests, brokers are really plugged into when boats are coming to market, you know, um, so it really can be helpful. I just particularly in this market. <laughs> yeah, really. Well, the guy I just Deb was just talking about uh, that I matched up with somebody who was uh, had their boat for sale, uh, but was going to sell it themselves. Um, he had tried to buy a boat through a broker and just tried to do it on his own. And he just had a miserable experience with it. It doesn't mean that uh, you can go directly to the broker anytime. And 90% of the time you're going to get a good broker. Uh, right. And especially if you get a, a licensed broker, a lot of states don't require licenses for brokers. Uh, but if you get a licensed broker, you know that the state's staying on top of them uh, also. So uh, you can still go directly to a broker. But uh, for him, he wish he would have had a buyer's broker to answer all the questions that didn't get answered because he didn't understand the process at the time. So let's talk a little bit because you have done the whole loop and then you've done extensive cruising beyond that back to the Bahamas, back to the Chesapeake, up the inland rivers, lots of side trips. Um, so tell us for someone who's maybe just now planning a loop and considering how long they want to take and what side trips, what are some of kind of the must do places to see? What are some of your favorites, whether it's because of a particular town or a particular waterway, where are you going to tell people they really should not miss? Well, I tell you, um, we talk a lot about the loop being made up of small towns, but I'm going to tell you, we had a blast in big cities. We we really were, we took on our whole sightseeing hat that way. Chicago was unbelievable. You can dock right downtown at DeSable. It's in the perfect time of year that when you're looping, it's right usually around Labor Day, and everybody's out. If you like a blues bar, like we love a blues bar and good Chicago pizza, we rented segways and we tooled around there. We saw the Museum of Science and Industry. I thought that was phenomenal. Um, and then, you know, then the next thing you know, you've got a small town. So when you're doing the rivers, you hit, uh, after Paducah, you hit Green Turtle Bay. In fact, I've got one of their shirts on right now. But Green <laughs> Turtle Bay becomes like a resort for you because you've now done all of these locks and you're in this oasis with probably 25 looper boats and it is it's just a big party and they have the best spa the best spa for women it's it's really great um in florida i really enjoyed around sarasota the ringling museum so it's the ringling circus museum it's it's a phenomenal site to go through that and the history of the circus was um really special, I thought. Uh, it, I agree. I already mentioned Paducah, uh, but uh, I think New York, uh, I mean, everybody gets a picture of going in front of the Statue of Liberty with their boat in the foreground. I mean, you always, you have to have a looper boat with a buddy boat when you do that. So somebody, you can take their picture and they can take your picture in front of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, you can anchor behind the Statue of Liberty for the night. But to go to Staten Island or somewhere and get into Marina and then take off and go into New York City, go see a play because the plays are open again. Uh, go see a play, go shopping, go do stuff. And so the big cities are also a great place to go. But I'm, I'm, I tell people I'm a Southern boy, Southern California, Southern Texas and Southern Florida. So give me the Bahamas, give me the Keys, give me, give me all those places that I just love to hang out in. Uh, and you get up into Canada, Killarney, and, and some of these places up on the Georgian Bay and the North Channel. Uh, it, it, that's one of the, probably the biggest questions that we get is, what was your favorite spot? And I keep wanting to say, what hundred miles do you want to talk about? Because, <laughs> because there's every hundred miles, there's a great place that you'll talk about for the rest of your time after you finish the loop. 
Um, we loved um, that North Channel. Bay, there's a place called Bay Fin, um, and you take your boat back there, you anchor, and then you take your dinghy in to um, Topaz Lake. And it's just like a, a lake that's topaz, and they have wild blueberries that you can pick. And you bring it back to the boat, and you've already had Canadian maple syrup that you bought. We we made pancakes. Oh my God! I mean, that was a great <laughs> memory for me. I love that. Um, that that um, when you're in the Benjamin Islands in Canada, they've got these flat rocks, and everybody's anchored like in the same. You, you would think like you would be around nobody, but everybody was there, and there were a lot of loopers, a lot of Canadians. And the Canadians asked us if we would all like to go to shore and have rock tails. We call them rock tails. And they brought a table and it was just like doing dock tails. Everybody brought their drinks. Put and, a bonfire out there and just had a Oh great my time. God. It was like everywhere you everywhere you, go. everywhere yeah. you go. Everywhere you go. Oh, those people up in Michigan now. Mm -hmm. Don't don't miss if you go to Mackinac Island to have dinner at the Grand Hotel. That if you don't have a jacket, a dinner jacket. They have them there for men and a tie, and tie. And tie. I didn't have a tie. I, yes. I think I had a jacket and I don't know, a paisley tie or something when I went in there. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the highlight of your loop to have dinner at the Grand Hotel. We've got a couple shout outs for you. Carousel says hello. Hi, guys. Hey, man. And uh, one eyed dog who is probably somewhere nearby, I'm guessing. Hey, April, <laughs> good to see you. If I open up the back, they're right there. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, Kim, that was probably one of my best highlights of our loop was that we we matched up with a buddy boat. And, you know, I've seen some things on the forum about people talk about buddy boats, like, oh, man, you don't want to be stuck with these people forever. Well, I guess we've been <laughs> stuck with them since 2017. <laughs> <laughs> but we plan these trips and we're, I mean, we're not together 100% of the time, but I would say 85%. And uh, why it works out so well is that for us, the women are high energy and we're the goers, the planners, the guys are the laid back, let's go get some ice cream, let's take a nap guy, kind of guys. Well, April and I, we've already figured out the next 10 stops we want to go. All the guys have to do is plot it. And uh, so having this buddy boat, we, we've actually talked about places we want to go for the next few years. So, you know, we've got the Downey Sloop in our mind. We didn't get to do the Ohio River because April told me at the last minute she wanted to go all the way to Pittsburgh. I thought we were stopping <laughs> in Cincinnati. We never have enough time. We have to do that trip. And there's a bunch of loopers. This is called Life After the Loop uh, of going to France and renting these Le Boats. And when you go to, um, we got the information from one of the rendezvous, the people from the boat was there, but you can rent these canal boats and you can put two couples on a boat. And I'm going to tell you any, any person that doesn't even have any skill can uh, drive these boats. We've got another hello um, from Susan on Reverie. Ah, close to, close so, to got it. We have a little bit more than five minutes left. So what have we not talked about that you really would like those planning and dreaming I, I to think, know? I think, I think you hit the, the key thing there uh, is for the planners is uh, pieces of advice we can give for the planners on, on getting ready to do the loop and what they're thinking about. Uh, I've already touched on one, which is buy a boat you can afford. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to enjoy the boat. You're going to spend too much money on it. You're going to complain about it and everything else. Things are going to break down. This is an adventure. The, the loop is an adventure. It's not a cruise. You're going to have things go good. You're going to have a couple things go bad. Don't worry about it. It will all be taken care of. But it is an adventure. And like all adventures, there's challenges. And, and expect the challenges, meet them, and enjoy the adventure. And make sure your wife is prepared. I can't tell you how many new loopers we've met coming. It was last year, especially on the rivers, that it was the first time the wife had been out on the boat. She didn't know how, how to tie off on a, on a cleat. She didn't know how to do anything with fenders. Teach her to do a clove hitch. Teach her fender placement. Talk to her about this. Practice before you go out. Watch some locking videos. 
Um, we've seen a lot of boats not prepared for correct lines and fenders for the locks. Please, so please, please. As a captain, I'll say this right off the bat. Please have your lines all set. That should be at least four lines set on the side of your boat before you pull into a slip. Not pull into a slip and then decide to put your lines out. <laughs> Please. And then Good I advice. Wrote, I wrote a quick list. Now, I don't think you can quick. take notes on this, but these are things <laughs> that we bought for our boat that we have really enjoyed. We bought okay, kayaks. Helpful. We bought kayaks, uh, the electric folding bike. Pico chairs. There are these folding chairs that West Marine has huh? that uh, fold like a laptop. Collapsible wagon for grocery shopping. LED outdoor lights for 4th of July and, and holidays. Um, bamboo sheets make life a lot easier. They're lightweight for drying. Um, snapware. You need, you need um, things on your boat to keep out the humidity. Oh, if you like wine, freezer wine glasses. That keeps, if you like a white wine, it keeps your white wine really cold. Uh, I have a food saver, a soda stream, uh, Instapot, and uh, oh, I bought these beach towel clips for the rails. So if you have any wet towels, it's always a great thing. So that's a great list. Really helpful for somebody who's trying to figure out how to organize their galley. Um, and what some of the must-have things aboard. And Instant Pots have become so popular over the past few years and a great thing to have aboard. Do you have a full-size Instant Pot or one of the minis? A full-size, the six, I guess it's a six-quart, so yeah. I, I fought it for a long time because I also have a, um, a, a slow cooker on board, but now I don't use a slow cooker. Um, any other tips? Uh, everybody talks about dock tails, um, and it's traditional to bring some kind of a dish to share. Any kind of galley tips or recipes or thoughts about what people are typically bringing to dock tails? Do you have a signature dish that you bring? Well, you know, I would try to think of uh, six things that you can rotate in and out of dock tails. That, that seems to be the, um, the, the easiest thing. I, I think that, you know, if you've got access to an oven sometimes those are those things go really well if somebody bakes something that's hot that's very different for dock tails but um i don't really have anything signature i i go i struggle too kim <laughs> <laughs> so uh derek uh is joining us and he's planning to do the loop in a few years he's in killarney so um he's in already in a spot that a lot of loopers are hoping to get to one day um we love killarney it has a great Irish singer up there, right, Derek? <laughs> <laughs> so one other question that we hear a lot, and especially since you are on um, one of the larger boats, square footage wise, interior space, do you have a lot of guests who come aboard? We've got lots of loopers who plan for guests, um, and then some who have all the guests they expect, and some who never really quite have those guests come because of the challenges of figuring out where to pick them up and drop them back off. How did that work out for Gypsy's Palace? Did you find a lot of folks came to visit? Well, during my loop, I had people scheduled for all these different lakes of the loop. Oh yeah, we want to do this. We want to do this segment. Nobody showed because <laughs> I had to be the darn travel agent. I mean, I didn't know what airport to tell them to come in. I didn't know all of this stuff, but the people that were resourceful were the ones that met us, but we hardly had anybody while we were looping meet us. And the one time I did, my girlfriend wanted to go to, we, we took a side trip to Nashville, which I highly recommend. And uh, I, I don't know, you, you're very date challenged when you boat. You can't remember if it's Saturday or <laughs> what day of the week it is. I'll be darned if I thought she was coming the next week and she called me and said, I'm at the airport in Nashville. And we were not even in Paducah yet. So we had to have her stay in a hotel. <laughs> we tell we tell people we can tell you where, yeah, and we, or we can tell you when, but we can't tell you where and when. That yeah, means, that's exactly the right way to do it. Um, yeah, and, and uh, we have guests coming to New Bern uh, this week on Thursday that are coming. Now we knew we would be there at, for four days, so they could book a trip into Raleigh, and then we had them fly out of Norfolk. So that. We've got like uh, five, three people coming. Yep. 
So where there's a will, there's a way. But you're absolutely right. That's kind of the old looper adage that you can tell them where or when, but not both. And, um, you know, a lot of the bad decisions for miserable weather days are made because you're trying to get somewhere at a specific time. So that's also great advice. We are going to hold it there. We It is uh, 6 o'clock here on the East Coast, and we uh, know a, a lot of people are probably wrapping up their docktails and moving on to their dinner hour. So, okay. Stephen Debbie Russell, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for all the tips you shared and the, the stories of your loop. We enjoyed hearing them. Thanks for being here. And what, one thing we do is when we have a drink or docktails, we say, to, to the, the loop. loop. To the loop. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for everyone who's joined us on Facebook. We will see you again two weeks from now with our next DocTales. Be safe, everyone, and have fun out there. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.